and welcome to the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books podcast. How are you feeling today? I am absolutely brilliant. Thanks. Good to see you guys. How are you doing? Yeah, we're doing well. Share with everybody what you just completed to get energized for today's episode. Ah, yes. Well, I'm calling from the island of Bali in Indonesia, so it's four o'clock in the morning for me. So I had to get up at three and do a Kundalini yoga uh, set of kriyas and some breath work just to uh, make sure I was on point to uh, to field your questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. Why don't we kick off today's episode with a little introduction? Why don't you share with everybody who you are, where you come from, and why you decided to write this book, How to Die Happy. Mm, thank you. Well, my name is Martin O'Toole. I'm originally from Yorkshire in England, and I've had a, a, a curious path to find myself uh, living a mindful life in, in Bali, and the curious path, some of which is covered in the book, uh, albeit anecdotally, but essentially, um, wow, what had me write the book? I would say having hit rock bottom with a, a loaded shotgun pointed to my face uh, a few years back and uh, came very close to ending my life. Uh, thankfully didn't. I was talked out of it by my beagle, which is also mentioned in the book. Um, I think that chapter is called Last Night a Beagle Saved My Life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that began a, a very um, long journey of, uh, of self-realization, self-discovery. Uh, ultimately working with uh, Far Eastern and ancient philosophies, psychedelics. And, uh, and here I am today, grateful to be alive. To provide even more context, there's a little quote that I'd like to read from the beginning of the book. It says, quote, it took over four decades, two divorces, three mental breakdowns, countless physical injuries, and one near suicide, which you just highlighted, to question whether this was living. And so <laughs> it's a great way to set the stage for who we're talking to today, because I think parts of that, what that, that quote that I just read are going to be very relatable to today's audience. So what do you mean by that? What do you mean by it took all of that to question whether this was living? What do you mean living? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, I, I neglected to mention I was a high function alcoholic and addict. It's a, it's a funny, it's a funny thing because some of us, in the recovery community wear that like an like a badge like an identity but i i don't really because i don't i don't use the language in recovery i am fully recovered and that is quite controversial and i respect anybody in the 12 steps program who's, who's who who has an alternate truth of course uh, but thanks to um my life's journey um i have a different perspective so yeah what is living well i, I spent all of that time trying to work out what living was and what happiness was i i have been in pursuit of happiness having been uh having grown up in a in an alcoholic family so my mum was an alcoholic from from day dot and uh and that came with all of the all of the usual drama that you might expect uh and uh three dysfunctional children or boys uh, a very unhappy childhood primarily so I was desperate to find happiness and uh, and I, I looked for it everywhere. And as uh, as as Rumi, the, the 12th century mystic and poet said, maybe you're searching among the branches for what may only be found in the roots. And boy, oh boy, did I, did I check out those branches. So it was uh, I was looking uh, in status, in in uh, in possessions, uh, in satiation. I was looking everywhere for happiness, but never really truly understood what happiness was. So I suppose that's what I mean by living. Uh, I was actually doing stuff, consuming uh, and being consumed. And of course, self-harming the whole way. Not that I realized I was self-harming at the time. Hmm. How do you, you know, you, we talk about happiness. How do you describe happiness and what does that, what does that mean to you? That's a really good question. Of course, I've stuffed it all into 354 pages of a book. <laughs> right. <laughs> now we need it summarized in one line. Yeah. Simplify, Just, summarize. Good luck. <laughs> down here. Yeah, I mean, th this book is an exploration of my journey of understanding what happiness is and is not. If I could... Okay, well, I suppose the best way to explain it is, is I've, I've outlined... I stumbled upon a, a, a process called the anatomy of happy. Mm. You have to go through that process and do the work, do the work. You know, we call this 
self-help business that work for a reason. And I think now more than ever, I'm, I'm, uh, there are hacks everywhere, right? And all due respect to many authors out there, there are hacks in hacks for hacks and there are books for these things. And my realization is there is no hack for happiness. It's not a short term fix. It's not, you know, yeah, you can get, you can do what I just did, a 45 minute uh, Kundalini yoga session. I'm absolutely on top of the world. I'm energized. So the, the dopamine, the energy, the cheese up. Um, but is that happiness? No. What I realized actually that, that the happiness was once you've gone through all of that process, so you can then have a daily practice. Happiness is, is working in this balance of what I jokingly called the Zen Ven. Um, and this is the convergence of four circles, really, four territories, awareness, presence, gratitude and acceptance. And that's a place to play during the day. And if I might just add, obviously, you asked me to do it in one line. I've definitely not done that. Um, but if you can conceive awareness, acceptance, presence and presence and gratitude as being those four fundamental pillars that we've always to have our eye on every day in the present moment, then we can truly achieve happiness. However, there's one thing we must, must, must get our heads around. And, and this is the, uh, the Buddhist concept of anicca, which means impermanence, which is connected very closely to dukkha, which means suffering. Um, the idea being that the two have a very close relationship. So the Buddha used to say that attachment is the root to all suffering. So we only suffer because we cling and we cling to everything. Uh, I cling to this Mac M1, this MacBook M1 that I'm talking to you on. I cling to this Audio Technica, Technica mic because it's a nice mic. I cling to this hand because I need it. I cling to these eyes, right? I cling to this body. However, everything I just mentioned is subject to the universal law of impermanence. And this is a Nietzsche, impermanence. So until we can grasp impermanence on, a, on an, an absolutely subatomic, intrinsic level, we can't be truly happy. So what I mean to say is, actually, happiness is also subject to the laws of impermanence, which means you're not always going to be happy. But in knowing that, you are. And there's the paradox. Yeah, there's... I love that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just was going to say, I love that. I love that answer. And um, you did excellent at condensing all of that into a <laughs> succinct way. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And I think it is like, it's such a complicated subject for so many people because I've, suf I've suffered with depression and anxiety and all sorts of mental disorders over my life. And I feel like there was there was a good period of time that I was just like, I am I'm unhappy more than I'm even feel this happiness thing. I don't even know what I'm supposed to feel like. I don't even know what happiness is. So it's nice to see people like you doing doing the work. I don't know, doing a lot of the work for us and showing us that, hey, it's not this this simple. You're going to feel happy and you're going to be happy all the time. And that's it. It's, we're all done. It's like you reach it and then then you're there. And I just, I just think we don't, we don't think of happiness that way. We think of it as the state that we're going to reach. And then we just continue to stay there. But obviously that leads us down all kinds of uh, dark paths. Right. And um, to follow up with that, like, do you think that are we, are we supposed to be happy on this planet? Like, do you think that's something that we should chase and we should go after? What a great question. I, I think, I believe that uh, at our essence, we are happy. We, we are fundamentally naturally happy, but what we, we have a, we have a strange existence here. I call our existence earth school. I call this place earth school. I, cl I call this an earth rover because uh, I, I'm, I believe that I am consciousness utilizing a meat suit to get around uh, planet earth. Okay. So that just so, we're, just so everybody understands the premise. Um, and, but I, I, I also truly un intrinsically understand that, um, you know, we're born happy. But then what happens is this thing called life uh, or, or what psychiatrists or psychologists would call conditioning. So, you know, year by year, moment by moment, year by year, layer by layer, this egoic uh, layer cake is, is thrown onto us. And the irony being, actually, it's, it's our friends and family that, that, who are accidentally vomiting this, this stuff at us. When I say stuff, I mean beliefs, thoughts. Think about it. You know, you, you're born into a into a country, into a, a part of a country, into a religion, maybe. 
um, into a neighborhood, uh, into a, a color of skin. So from the day you're born, you're already provided with a, a series of illusory identities for which you will fight for a good lump of your life. Is that you? No, it's not you at all. They're just part, they're just aspects or facets, if you like, of ego. So I believe we are intrinsically happy, but I also believe we live in a, in a time where everything is either by design, depending on whose perspective you, you, you listen to, or just coincidentally designed to, to cause us unhappiness. <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong, there's this thing called free will. Right. Choice. The whole book, the book is about choice. I must say choice several million times. You know, we all have a choice, but we don't realize we have a choice. So, you know, when we get up in the morning and we we take the cereal from the shelf and we put it in the bowl. Did you look at the ingredients? You know, uh, when we when we drive off to oh, and then we when we use one of 72 uh, toxic household products that did we look at the ingredients there? I've got a point here, so bear with me. The, the point is that through the entire day, we are subjected to uh, energy and to um, things that we put in our body, things that, we are, uh, things that are going on around our body, things that we watch, things that we listen to, the music we, that we take on board. So we're subjecting our body and our psyche to so, so much uh, toxification. And that could be, you know, that's that is physical, physiological and mental and spiritual. So all of these things intrinsically make us unhappy. Uh, our interactions with people make us unhappy, um, but we don't we just tolerate them. And I write this. I write about this in the book. I write about um, Eric Burns, transactional analysis, Stephen Cartman's uh, drama triangle, the beauty of boundaries, you know, the, the, the power of the word no. You know, all of these things that I, I think for whatever reason, we've just we've become very, very complacent and we and we're an apathetic. And it's not our fault. You know, it's just this place we live in, Earth School, that's actually systematically bringing us down. And unless we choose to start observing all of that stuff and then step into our sovereignty. And that's essentially what I'm inviting people to do It's to nobody's going to rescue us. You know, nobody I had I had help. I had a great therapist at one point and I had a couple of friends who, who helped. But in the main, I didn't tell anybody about my depression. I, I don't know about you. Most of us don't. You know, we carry depression and suicidal thoughts. And actually, the worse those thoughts are, the more ashamed we feel. So the less likely we are going to discuss this stuff. And of course, then we become our own therapist, which is the worst thing that could happen because we're not really qualified. Oh, yeah. And we're depressed. <laughs> <laughs> don't take his advice why because he's not in a good mood <laughs> okay yeah right but of course we don't have that in a dialogue do we we just have this i'm depressed i know i'm depressed i know it's shit it's shit sorry can i swear on your podcast yes yes i apologize so anyway i'm rambling away but um you know the point is we have a choice but we must 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 make that conscious choice to start looking at this the things around us. What am I eating? What am I listening to? What am I watching? Who am I hanging out with? Where do I go? You know, what all of these questions that we just don't do all that often. Although I must say, I think we are also in an, age, an exciting age when we are doing that. And, you know, your podcast is a, a, and, um, and, and the whole concept is a wonderful example of that, of how so many books and authors and, and thought leaders are coming out to say, hey, hang on a minute. Check this. Have you thought about this? It's called self-help, called self-care. I call it self-love. And it's one of the stages of the anatomy of happy. And it's work. And that's why I love awareness is part of your Zen Ven. And yeah. it reminds me of a, a concept I read about in Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson, where he talked about choice. And he said, everybody today, and I'm speaking to the audience right now, everybody, every one of us has millions, billions, an infinite number of future versions of ourselves. And we get there through a series of choices. So if I shut my laptop off right now, that leads to a different version of me in the future because we don't get to finish this conversation. And it might lead to a different version of the people around me because they don't get to listen to this conversation. And you know, there's another version of me that asks a different question that leads to a different series of dialogue. And that's a different version of me in the future. And that happens when you take the cereal 
out of the cabinet that happens with every single decision that we make. And so once you become aware of choice, you can start to make decisions that lead you through that anatomy of happy process that you talk about. But anyway, now I'm rambling a little bit. Your rambles, Martin, are a little bit more valuable than my rambles, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to back up a little bit. The first section of this book is about dying. I'm fascinated by death. And as you address in the book, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in life, we choose to ignore this truth of death. And you have a great question that you ask podcast guests and that you ask the reader kind of to do in the book, which is imagine you're going to die in five minutes. Write a list of your top 10 regrets and see what's on that list. Why do you encourage people to do that? That's a great question. And it's, it, the reason why I, 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 ask, I invite people to, uh, to consider their top 10 death regrets, and I, and I do it in the book as well uh, early, early on, is because what I'm inviting people to do is take a look at themselves without judgment, without mitigation. Now, my mom died in 2014, January, two, January 6, 2014. We had a, a pretty terrible relationship. You know, she was an alcoholic and I, and I was a, 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 an angry young man uh, who wound up very much resenting her for, for all of the problems that we had. Now, I saw her on the Christmas day of, the, of 2013, thankfully. And we had a nice day. And I write about this in the book, actually. We had a nice day together. And I gave her a kiss on the cheek, which is actually a real rare thing for, for us, that sort of intimacy. So then I, when I found out she died, of course, we, we, we go through the five stages of grieving, which people will know of. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote all about that. Check it out. Um, but I had so much that I hadn't said to her. And not all good stuff either, right? You know, actually, mm -hmm. I wished I, I wish I had expressed in a in an in a mature and calm way some some of the things I was feeling. So this is one of the reasons why I'm inviting people to do this because either somebody you know is going to die very soon, or you're going to die. You know, because the whole point is newsflash: we're all going to die. And there are two chapters in the book. One's called "Everyone You Know Is Going to Die," Part One. And the other one's called Everyone You Know Is, is Going to Die Part Two. I make this point very, very clear uh, regularly at the, the beginning of the book, not to be morbid. And, you know, this is the Western response, isn't it? Oh, you're so morbid. And of course, the dictionary definition of the word is an unhealthy fascination with death. My question, and I ask the question in the book, is who gets to define what's unhealthy and healthy? Because as far as I'm concerned, when we push death to the back of the queue, which we very often do in the West, right? We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. We don't want the kids to think about it. Although it's okay if they watch all of that stuff on the TV with death, of course, or play those computer games. We do all the other sort of paradoxical stuff we do to do with death. When we, when we push it away like that, is that healthy? Or is it healthy when somebody dies and we haven't done any of that work whatsoever? And then suddenly we're faced with this this void. There's a guy called Jamie Anderson, who I quote in the book, who said, grief is just love with nowhere to go. Which is I circled that one a couple of times. <laughs> such a beautiful quote and you know, kudos to him for, for such magical words. But that really resonated with me. You know, when my mom died, I had this anger, but I also had a lot of, I had this love and there was nowhere to send it. Nowhere physical, all right? And, and there are all these words and things that I, that I couldn't say to her. And it occurred to me, actually, that was a beautiful lesson for me. Uh, it was a painful lesson, and unfortunately, I, you know, I took the hard, I took the hard road through that lesson because I was, I was, I just drank more and snorted more, um, and uh, and self harmed more and ha harmed others more emotionally speaking. So the invitation is is to say, look, guys, everybody's going to die. You can't pretend otherwise because everything in this plane is subject to the laws of impermanence. It's just a matter of velocity. You ask the question in the book, at what point does our fear of death obstruct our ability to live? That's something that we talked with Robert Greene a little bit about on our podcast with him a while back. Yeah, death is pushed to the corners of our society. We ignore it. We pretend it doesn't exist. And as a result, we actually limit our own capabilities. 
we're living a smaller version of what life has to offer. So what are some of the benefits? Like you call it an emotional service to think about death. What are some of the benefits to understanding that 178,000 people die every single day? And it's not that weird. It happens. Right? <laughs> well, I, there, I think for me, there are myriad benefits. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once you truly embrace the fact that you may well get hit by a bus when you walk out the door or mom, dad, you know, the dog, the wife, the husband, whoever those people are or, or creatures, sentient creatures are that are close to you are, are going to die. You can then start to reevaluate your relationship. And first and foremost, you've got to reevaluate your relationship with yourself, right? Because yeah, stating the obvious, and I'm, I'm talking to, to, to guys who work in the self-help industry, if we don't do that work first, then how can we possibly uh, reap the benefits uh, of it with with other people, right? So, so fundamentally, it's about readdressing our relationship with ourself. But then, we, of course, we can readdress our relationship with everybody else. Now, in my experience, what that what that became was this this whole new idea that, wow, you know, right now I'm talking to these two incredible guys who are doing this incredible job spreading the word of, uh, of of all these incredible authors so so i'm i'm truly truly present in this moment and therefore i'm i'm enjoying it uh i would say from a higher seat of consciousness i'm observing it so i'm truly aware of it actually i'm aware that i'm aware of it as well so you know get your head around that i'm aware um, that you're aware that you're aware of it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about you, buddy? <laughs> All very aware. <laughs> but, but in that awareness, I mean, you know, maybe that was a, a micro example, but maybe you, you feel it, you know, in that being aware that you are aware, there's a wonderful sense of being alive, you know, truly being alive. And and so, so this is why presence is very much uh, one of those four components of, of the, the, the ongoing, the Zen Ven, you know, the anatomy of happy, because once we truly accept death in that way, we can see life for what it actually is, a, an absolute unequivocal gift. Um, and it took me a long time to work that out. And as I said, you know, four, four decades, um, divorces and suicide and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, I, you know, I've, I've had what, what people would call, I suppose, um, a rebirth, you know, and I don't want to come across like an evangelist here, but... I'm now experiencing a life within a life, <clears throat> excuse me, and I couldn't be more grateful. And I suppose part and parcel of, of what How to Die Happy tries to do is, is invite other people to do that, you know, to, 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 to search for that. But don't search hard because I also talk about Taoism and the Wu Wei and surrender. And actually, you know, this stuff just is, it just happens. Actually, you don't really have to work for this stuff if you follow a process. I'm rambling again. <laughs> I love your rambles. I could listen to you, listen to you all day. Um, okay. Lots of wisdom. I'm, I'm so curious, like, how does someone, you know, we live in the, the Western world in America, and there's just it's chaos all around us, like we're constantly busy and doing stuff. And there's there's always something else. We're always thinking about the future. We have anxiety, we have depression, all these different things. And how do we cultivate just in our day to day lives? How do we cultivate or how can we start to cultivate presence? Hmm. What a wonderful question. I have um, the chapter in the book called Weapons of Mass Tranquilification. Now, you guys are readers, so you'll know that I made that word up. <laughs> for which it's I a great word. Up, for which <laughs> I made that apology. I love the word tranquilify. I'd like to introduce it to the, to the dictionary. Um, fundamentally, we have to start where we are. Right. And, and I think this is part and parcel of perhaps the one of the challenges we have in in this in the self-help space is that it's all well and good. This guy here, you know, with his tan, living in Bali, radiant, having a great time, enjoying life, grateful, blah, blah, blah. But he had to ride through some serious, you know, like he did an Andy Dufresne and swam through three miles of, of shit in a tunnel to get here. So when you're when you're in a when you're the the far end of that spectrum it can seem impossible i think and it certainly i remember it seeming impossible i remember wondering how how on earth could you possibly get to a point where you don't want to kill yourself 
because I used to have suicidal thoughts every day. Um, <clears throat> in reality, the, the first place and the simplest place to start is with breath. And so I talk about breath and meditation all the time in this book. And, and, and I'm aware that uh, I'm obviously talking to listeners who might be, yeah, OK, I've heard about meditation, but I'm too busy for meditation. I haven't got time, yada, yada. So I'm aware that I might be banging uh, the same old drum. But trust me, breath is a game changer. Breath is actually everything. Uh, and actually, the more research I did, and I, I had a forward, the forward for the book was written by the wonderful Lee Holden, who is a, a bit of a legend. Um, uh, he was widely responsible for bringing Qigong to the West. In fact, he used to do Qigong on PBS every morning in, in your part of the world to 55 million people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, Lee uh, did a documentary series where they, they traveled all around the world meeting what they called superhumans and what they discovered was that all of these yogis and masters from all walks of life from all corners of the earth and different eras right because obviously you know some of these they didn't all didn't all happen on earth at the same time they all had one thing in practice and it was a, it was a type of breath work so it's interesting to me and it's been interesting for some time now that the breath work has, has been at the uh, you know one of the seeds of, of our mindfulness practice <clears throat> yet nobody tells us about it i don't know about you but nobody told me that i was that i wasn't consciously breathing nobody told me about belly breathing versus chest breathing so it turned out i spent 40 odd years basically doing fight or flight breathing apart from maybe when i was asleep and as i recall some a lot of those nights were fairly anxious and of course a lot of those nights were also uh, turbo powered with cocaine so there was no sleep um so i would say breath really really just tune into your breath so and you've got to start with with each moment. So the more anxious you are, the only thing you can do is just start with that, this moment right now. Just check into your presence and it's just ride that breath. Eckhart Tolle said one conscious breath is a meditation. Mm. What wisdom, you know? Just... Yeah. Yeah. As you're as you're saying, uh, focus on your breath. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> just like it just brings you into the it does. It brings you into the presence. So thank you. Nick, did you did you have something to say? No, I started focusing on breath maybe seven <laughs> years ago now and mm -hmm. uh yeah it's it's totally changed everything i don't think i had ever consciously breathed for the mm -hmm. first 21 22 years of my life i mean i never even thought about my weight in a chair or you know my weight against the back of a chair or anything like that i was uh you know, I was there, but I wasn't conscious. And Martin, I think you say something similar in the book, like you live this entire life unconsciously until a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. It's fight or flight, isn't it? it it's, 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 it's not, you're aware, we're, a, we're aware that we have to trudge on through earth school, you know, and there's a, I quote a poem in the, in the book Invictus by um, William Ernest Henley, which is a beautiful poem that but essentially, it, it's got a wonderful line that says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. But it's it's really about the bludgeonings of life, you know, of soldiering on. <clears throat> you won't be able to see this very well, but this uh, the origin of this tattoo was just the two crosses, right? So the two crosses on top of each other, which is the Greek sign, ingus, which means where there's a will, there's a way. Now, I've I've transmuted that tattoo. This is actually a hand um, hand dot tattoo done by the Mentawi tribe in, in Indonesia because I, I wanted to transmute it because I realized, actually, I, I spent like my whole adult life saying where well, there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> you know, fight it, fight it, hustle and grind, hustle and grind. No, turns out that wasn't the way. Turns out all I was doing there was just just fighting to stay alive and, 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 and consuming at the same time and you know, doing all of this, this stuff that I guess a lot of us just believe we're here to do. But at no point was I really sitting with my body in a different way, you know, feeling my spirit, my energy. And I was an agnostic and an atheist, by the way. This, this book does dive into deeply metaphysical concepts. Um, uh, and of course, I talk about uh, philosophies and, and what people might misconstrue as religions but <clears throat> I was a, an atheist and agnostic for a long time so it, it, this whole thing sort of came as a surprise to me this spirituality business 
Oh yeah. You know, you mentioned um, every day being a fight and even now though, I've, I've come a long way, but I don't think I'm, I'm definitely not where you are yet. I still wake up in the morning and feel like I have to, I have to fight. It's like another day I have to, okay, I have to fight through this and I have to fight through that. How do you, man, I, I, I realize like there's a lot in your book about this, which is great, but like, is there anything that somebody, somebody listening today, is there any practice or anything that they can do just to, I know start with the breath, but is there anything that they can do to let go of that whole idea of this is a fight and I, I have to keep punching my way through or I'm not going to make it? No, that's a beautiful question. Uh, yeah, there, are, there of course there are many, many practices you can do. I, I, I always suggest to anyone who's sort of lost in the dream spell a little bit. The dream spell being the matrix, mm -hmm. and our immediate need as soon as we wake up to plug back into it. You know, unfortunately, it starts with for a lot of people. Literally, they roll out of bed and and pick this up. So, <clears throat> I mean, that's a that's that's a game changer right there. Mm -hmm. Don't have that by the bed. Switch it off. Get an alarm clock. You remember them? <laughs> Get an alarm clock to wake you up. Do not use uh, that's that's that actually says present aware and aware on it. FYI, that's illustrated by Josh Kindle, the guy that did my uh, my book illustrations. Um, so keep the phone away from the bed as soon as you wake up and do a gratitude practice. That that would be my best advice. If you want to remind yourself, because I, I think how we, we operate, we're, we're, we're right back into, right, well, today's going to be a fight. What have I got to do to stay alive? Yada, yada. We're often thinking about what do I need to do? What do I need to uh, accrue? You know, what do I need to get? Obviously, I need to make money. I need to acquire this, do that. And so I, I often suggest to people to start with a gratitude practice. Actually, let's just, be, let's just check in and what we actually have. I talk about this in the book because ultimately, again, I'm trying to talk to people at different levels of, of, the, of their journey. Because you should be able to check into this book wherever you are on your, on your spiritual path or whatever you want to call it, or you know, self-realization journey. Um, so it might be that you're grateful for uh, you know, the house you have or the roof you have over your head. It, or it might be grateful for the, the beautiful person you, you wake up next to. <clears throat> But if we're really drilling it down and you haven't got anything to be grateful for, then I suggest that you get grateful for the air in your lungs and the fact that you've got a homeostatic system that just allows that to happen. Um, I don't know if anybody's had a breathing problem in their life. I did. Randomly, uh, through this process, I, I, did, I had some sort of a lung issue. And I don't know if it was, I s suspect it was probably a somatic issue like blocked trauma that I still had to clear. But I was struggling to breathe on a daily basis. I tell you, when you get to the point where you can't just naturally breathe and then you can breathe again, you become very, very grateful with uh, with the most simple of things. You know, so I would say a gratitude practice, first and foremost, as you say, there are lots of other things in the book. Gratitude is a big theme on this podcast. It's been a big theme in Luke's life, my life. We actually have a gratitude Slack channel where each member of the oh. Bookthinkers team writes three things that we're grateful for every single day. And we can also see each other's gratitude, which just helps to reinforce the importance. And that's been amazing. I suggest that utility in the book. There's a chapter in the book called um, Your Number One Superpower. And, and it's all about gratitude. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a huge, huge, huge fan of uh, being grateful. I suppose when, you've, when you find yourself staring down the barrel of a gun, uh, yeah, you, you can't help but be grateful. Uh, <laughs> so I'm super grateful for, for the smallest of things. And you know, for me, actually, another uh, easy utility is just go out, sit down, you know, take your shoes off, take your shot socks and sh shoes off and ground and just sit down on the earth and just listen to the birds, check out the citharism of the wind through the trees, you know, just that simple stuff that, and start there. And then build up, you know? Yes. But when we do that, what are we not doing? Well, I, I'm not thinking about life in the matrix, which is fundamentally the point. Yeah. No, it is the point. I, I wanted to touch on something as we're getting into the, the last third of our show today, Martin. Uh, you mentioned you used to be an atheist. In the book, you talk about omnism, the idea that no one religion is the truth, but there is truth in all religions. And so I'd like to have you talk a little bit about that because... Luke and I have talked about this uh, extensively in the past, and I think this this word omnism um, 
it'll bring a lot of light to some people. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible idea, isn't it? I again, like all of these things, I, I stumbled across it on my on my self prescribed journey. Um, I was I was born into a Catholic family. And uh, for anyone born into a Catholic family, especially in England, in the I was born in 1975. Can you believe it? Um, so uh, there's, there is an element of um, how do we say this? You know, fairly dogmatic, uh, very strict doctrine. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of shouting from the priests uh, when I was a kid anyway, you know, when they deliver their sermons and stuff. And, you know, there's gen generally an idea that if you're not good then you know you're going to go to hell to hell or purgatory or and you know you might get smited by a, a vengeful god i'm not mocking um these religions incidentally so uh if, if anybody is triggered by that well observe your triggering would be the, the the obvious response to that but um the point is i i was i had religion stuffed down my throat for years and as a result i ran as far as i could and i, I recur refer to myself as a recovering uh catholic actually as as many do uh tongue in cheek so but all the while i was having these little um these strange metaphysical experiences through my life you know people are going to either believe this or not think i'm a crackpot or not and i respect your truth but also you know it's just the truth so um you know maybe experiences with ghosts for example we lived in a haunted house when i was a child um i was able to astral travel you know uh, as a child so i don't know if you you guys are familiar with astral traveling at all but that's a pretty cool thing to be able to do um uh, but i just i blocked all of this all of this out these ideas out um and then went headlong into a career as, as, as an ad man and a high functioning alcoholic and addict so so i i lost all sense of of uh of god for want of a better word and religion and spirituality um and then when i got sober when I cleaned my body and mind, I started to feel things that I'd never felt before. I started to feel uh, a newfound connection to to people, newfound connection to nature, uh, a, an incredible connection to me, um, which was, you know, kind of a beautiful thing. So then I started to explore these these different theosophies and philosophies, and I, I happened upon omnism and as you say omnism respects all religions um for for their own truths but essentially uh, argues well, it's not even an argument that uh, you, you couldn't possibly say that one religion is the absolute but they all share these these wonderful commonalities and newsflash what's the what's the the common denominator in in all religion it's love isn't it well most you know i suppose satanists might argue with you on that <laughs> but um uh so it is love and um that was where I, I i realized i could start to cherry pick from these other from these religions and these philosophies i don't um i i'm not really one for dogma uh, i i don't believe that you have to have a certain amount of people together saying certain words for for divinity to be present or for for spirit to be um uh, in the neighborhood uh, i think spirits in in all of us i think spirits in the trees and in the birds and in the insects so so i, I think we are surrounded by this energy which actually the taoists would call the Tao. Uh, and this is how i happened upon these eastern philosophies that actually made a lot more sense to me than western religions because the more you dive into taoism buddhism confucianism you see that actually they've got a lot in common with modern day psychology and modern day mental illness, right? The, these neuroses that we have, which incidentally, I, I also, I do respectfully put this forward in the book. I believe we're all mentally ill. It's just different levels. Um, because I, I believe that ego, which I call monkey fun, uh, in, a, in a fun loving way, uh can't help but create a little bit of uh mental illness for us all because monkeys still fixated on keeping us safe and alive so yeah it was it, i i don't know if you come across alan watts or ramdas uh timothy leary you know some of these great philosophers from the 50s and 60s and onwards of course who uh made great strides 
to talk about these the same religions uh, sorry the same philosophies and of course these guys were working with lsd uh quite frequently as well which was which was putting them in, in altered states of consciousness um and it's actually thanks to podcasts this this huge uh, exponential growth we've had in podcasts now that that, it, that got me back into you know to listening regularly to alan watts and ramdas and going wow hang on a minute this guy's making a lot of sense because and of course uh ramdas or uh, dick alpert was a psychiatrist so you've got someone who understands the human psyche here we go he's got what he's got a good one i can see beautiful yeah i mean just everything the man said and wrote was just magical right i mean i i like to think that i'm a wordsmith but Ram <laughs> you are a wordsmith but yeah well, ramdas has some great stuff in there too next level so anyway so that i i suppose the point is the invitation in the book is let's look let's have another conversation about the word spirituality let's have another conversation about religion let's reevaluate these ancient uh teachings that have been around for thousands of years that sadly are, are disappearing you, you got you've had Ryan Holiday on the show, uh, incredible author. I've got a lot of respect for the man, um, and he's of course done a phenomenal job in in resurrecting Stoicism, to the point where you know there's even in in Bali now down down the road from me there's a little Stoic society. These you know these um, and fairly young people you know young people are meeting up and discussing philosophy, discussing Stoicism. What a wonderful thing! So. Similar to, to what Ryan's done with, with Stoicism, I'm, I'm incredibly keen to say, let's not forget the, the Chinese sages. Let's not, I mean, Lao Tzu, Confucius, uh, Zhuang Su, some of these, the, the, the Tao Te Ching and many, many, many other teachings, it, it can all be applied to, to living today. And it is, in a way, you know, it, it's, it's a, it rides the wave between spirituality and psychology. I think in a way that's fascinating and I invite people to reevaluate it. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I know Luke's got a question to wrap things up, but I did want to comment Martin that I've got quite a few tattoos uh, that remind me of concepts I originally learned in stoicism, uh, including a memento mori tattoo on my chest that I may have showed you during our first call that reminds me I am mortal and I am going to die every single day. And it's a beautiful tattoo reminder just as the one that you shared with us. Um, got a number of others as well, but Luke, you yeah, want to... you got one on the inside of your wrist that I've seen on your photos. What's that? Because I, I see it sometimes. I do. I, I have tattoos on both wrists. On this one, I have ataraxia, which is uh, an ancient Greek word meaning stillness, which I mm -hmm. discovered in Ryan's book, Stillness is the Key. Yeah, and that's a reminder to slow down and be more present for sure. And then I have the numbers one, two, and three. Every day I journaled three things that I was grateful for. And it had such a profound impact on my life that I wanted to either consciously or subconsciously default to gratitude thousands of times per day. And so I got it tattooed on my wrist. Oh. And on the back side of this wrist, I have a Spanish word, agradecido, which means gratitude as well. So it's just another reminder doesn't matter which side of my wrist is facing my eyes subconsciously. It's always there. Yeah. I, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing to do for us to get tattoos to remind us stuff. I'll, I know you're going to ask me another question, but that's, uh, that's the uh, Guru Rinpoche mantra, which means Om Ah Hung Benza Guru Pema Sidi Hung, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's, uh, it's kind of like the Swiss Army mantra. <laughs> it's, the, it's the mantra for everything, protection for um for love uh, to call in the, the power of all the buddhas but it's a it's an incredibly powerful mantra and i'm the same I I, i've got these mantras uh all lined up to to be tattooed all over my body just to remind yeah me. yeah me too i'm with you all right luke you want to bring us home yeah well man we just scratched the surface i want to i want to i want to <laughs> I I ask you about um psychedelics i want to talk to you about lsd and all those well those, let's those let's just have things. them back yeah, but for I'd sure. Love to come back. I'd love to come back for sure. <laughs> and I'm going to write another book about psychedelics soon. I'm going to go oh, to 
got i've got a we're, we're making a documentary and doing some cool stuff so i'd love to talk to you about that yes please do um because there's so many things that i'd like i said i want to dive into but unfortunately we don't we don't have the time today we didn't really uh i don't we talked a little bit about it but i think actually that may have been before we hit record which is the shadow work which i wanted to talk about but again we're gonna have to we're gonna have to have you back on to talk about that stuff as well i guess to to bring it home um one last question i like to i like to ask all of our guests this and that's if you die and you all all your work all everything is gone everything that you had you've put out all your books all the all the work that you've done is gone but you can leave behind one short piece of advice what would it be oh learn to love mm. yeah yeah that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a mic drop i would drop it but it, it's on a it's on an <laughs> Yeah, learn to love. Learn learn to love mm. in the realm of separation, where mm. where loving is so hard, mm. you know, and uh, and that separation starts inside in, inside us. We are we have all of this inner conflict, and this separation that keeps us from loving ourselves. So if we can learn to love ourselves first, truly and healthily, obviously, I'm not referring to narcissistic practices presently. Mm um then we can we can share that love with other people in a in a way that is an absolute game changer and speaking from personal experience from someone who spent his life in service to self and who now will spend the rest of his life in service to others which mm. is why I, which is why I wrote this book to wow. to give give other people the opportunity to to find something that I've invested a great deal of time energy money pain <laughs> no, blood shit and tears uh into finding and it's called happiness and it turns out it was it was always right here how crazy is that it's amazing well i appreciate you your energy has been this has been amazing i cannot believe how quickly the time has flown by i'm just like sitting here just uh, uh, man just taking it all in because you have so many good things to say so for anybody looking for you and looking for your book, uh, where can they go? What what can they do to find you? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Well, there's a website for the book. So it's howtodiehappybook.com. Uh, as Nick alluded, we also have a podcast. My partner, Jules, she's a, a yogi. We have a podcast uh, together. It's called How to Die Happy. So that's howtodiehappypodcast.com. You can find me on Instagram, Martin O'Toole, or you can find the podcast, How to Die Happy underscore podcast. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I'm, I, I am so, so grateful for what you're doing. I think it's a beautiful thing uh, for someone who loves to learn, who never did use to love learning, incidentally, but now these days, that's all I do. And the more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. Uh, so thanks for, for, for being bastions uh, for people to learn about more about themselves and the world. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>